Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mary Reed Leftwich, the Director of Learning at the Center of John Hines History Center. We are glad that you've joined us for the first of a series that we're starting with our amazing docent pool, thinking about the stories that we can uncover in Pittsburgh's history. And this afternoon, we're gonna be featuring the story of some women activists here in Pittsburgh history. And when we planned this program, we of course in no way envisioned how resonant and relevant those stories would be to us literally today, um, a day after several days of unrest in this country based in protest um, and signaling what we hope will soon be a resolution, solution to the end of oppression that we have seen. And also a day when we have voting and polling going on. Um, we didn't realize when we picked this date that we'd be having uh, the Pennsylvania primary today either. So a huge thank you to those that are out working the polls. We hope everyone, if you haven't voted today, you'll have a chance to do that because that story features prominently in the one that we we're gonna talk about this afternoon. So we're really excited you all have joined us. There will be a question or an opportunity for questions at the end. But I'm gonna introduce now our, one of our docents, Judy Sutton, who's been a docent with the History Center for several years um, and a former children's librarian, always an amazing storyteller who spent a lot of time researching two incredible women that she's gonna share you stories this afternoon with. So I'll turn it over to Judy. Welcome. Thank you. And today I'd like to talk about two remarkable women who lived in Pittsburgh, Jane Gray Swisshelm and Daisy Lampkin. Now they lived about a hundred years apart, but the amazing thing that I found was the similarities in their lives. They both worked for civil rights. They both worked for women's rights. And interestingly enough, they were both involved with newspapers. So I would like, okay, let's, we are having a little glitch, okay. So I would like to start off talking about Jane Grace Wishelm. This is actually a self-portrait of her that you can see on the screen at the moment. Now her list of firsts is impressive. She was one of the first female newspaper publishers in the country when she launched the Pittsburgh Saturday Visitor. She was one of the earliest women to be a Washington correspondent the first woman reporter to be seated in the Senate Press Gallery in 1850, one of the first female employees of the federal government, and she was instrumental in the passage of Pennsylvania's Married Women's Property Act of 1848. Prior to that, if a married woman owned property, it immediately went to her husband. Now, she was born in Pittsburgh, and her father died when she was only eight years old, leaving many debts. And lace making was a skill she learned early out of necessity. And at the age of 14, she began to teach school. Now, in 1835, at the age of 20, she married James Swisshelm. And this was an interesting marriage. There were religious and in-law challenges from the very beginning. He was a devout Methodist. She was a strict Presbyterian. Her husband not only expected her to adhere to the biblical text, dictating that wives submit to their husbands in all things, but he also expected her to keep house in the house owned occupied and supervised by his mother. Meanwhile, Jane's mother was encouraging her to leave Jane. Well, Jane lived in a house that her husband provided for her. However, he continued to live with his mother, making weekly visits to Jane. Mm, not a great way to start off a marriage. Well, after a year of this, the young couple decided that they needed to leave both mothers behind and they moved to Louisville, Kentucky. Now, when James's business there quickly failed, Jane supported the family by sewing corsets. 
In 1839, when Jane's mother grew gravely ill, she returned to Pittsburgh to care for her. And Jane, being ever the supportive husband, refused to leave Louisville. Jane's mother died in 1840, leaving her a small legacy, whereupon James filed suit against her state to get the money he felt he was owed as compensation for Jane's abandonment. Somehow or other, they got back together again. And in 1842, they were living in the Pittsburgh East End home that Jane named Swissvale. And this is an image of the home that they were living in. You, there is the house appears to be made of wood. There were trees around it. There was a fence around it and Jane loved this home. In Kentucky, Jane had her first real look at slavery and she was appalled at what she saw. Now back in Pittsburgh, she began to take an active part in the abolitionist movement. She wrote letters and articles to newspapers, but signed only her initials. She actually attacked some Pittsburgh ministers by name for what she thought was a lack of courage when they did not speak out forcefully enough about the evils of slavery. The editors of the papers told her that these articles were potentially libelous and asked them to sign her name. She to sign her name. She agreed to do this. This was a very brave move on her part because at that time a woman's name only appeared in print on the occasion of her marriage and her death. Now in 1847, financed with the small inheritance from her mother, somehow James didn't get his hands on it, she started her own anti-slavery newspaper with a strong feminist slant, the Pittsburgh Saturday Visitor. And this is the masthead from the paper. And you can see this is dated Saturday, April 7, 1849. Surprisingly enough, the male newspaper editors in Pittsburgh encouraged her because they dismissed her as a possible threat to their own circulations. They considered her paper highly specialized, non-competitive, and geared to female readers exclusively. Over seven years from 1847 through 1854, she published the Saturday Visitor in Pittsburgh. Her stand against slavery quickly attracted national attention and Horace Greeley invited her to write for the celebrated New York Tribune. Now, while the thrust of her political writing focused on anti-slavery issues, Jane also turned her pen on the laws prohibiting married women from owning property. These articles were instrumental in gathering support for the passage by the Pennsylvania State Legislature in 1848 of a law that allowed married women to own property. This is an image of the actual Pittsburgh Saturday Visitor from February the 12th, 1848. Wanting a closer look at Washington politics, in 1850, Jane contracted with the New York Tribune to provide regular reports for $5 per column. She soon was the first woman to gain a seat in the Senate Press Gallery. And this is a picture of Jane with her only daughter, Mary Henrietta, that was taken in 1853. In 1857, she moved with her only child, Mary Henrietta, to St. Cloud, Minnesota, the home of her sister. Her husband again charged her with abandonment and eventually divorced her. 
And when you think about the times in which this happened, divorce was a very rare occurrence. Here she started another abolitionist newspaper, the St. Cloud Visitor, which became the small town's only newspaper. Her newspaper battles in Minnesota against political corruption and slavery nearly cost her her life. She was particularly angry with St. Cloud's political boss, General Sylvanus Lowry, an aristocratic Southerner who owned slaves in the free territory of Minnesota. After one of her particularly fiery editorials, Lowry formed a committee of vigilance, broke into the newspaper's offices, smashed the printing press and threw the pieces into the nearby Mississippi River. Jane Garney, the distinct privilege of being burned in effigy by Democrats as the mother of the Republican Party. She took it as a badge of honor, raised money for another press, resumed her attacks, and eventually succeeded in driving Lowry from office. Now, this is an image of her office and home in St. Cloud. The back part of the picture on the left shows her home. The front is the office of the newspaper. You can almost make out people standing around and milling around the front of the building. And this is the part of the building that General Lowry would have broken into in order to get to her printing press and break it up. Now, during the Civil War in 1863, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, whom she had known when he practiced law in Pittsburgh, appointed her to a clerkship in the War Department. She was one of the first women to be appointed to a federal government position. While waiting for the job to become available, she worked as an army nurse in the Washington DC area. After the war, Jane started her final newspaper aptly titled The Reconstructionist. The paper was not to last very long, however. President Andrew Johnson ordered that she be fired from her government job for speaking disrespectfully of the president and her paper soon folded. She lived for a brief time with her daughter and son-in-law in Chicago, but sensing that her outspoken political views may have caused social difficulty for the couple, she returned to Pittsburgh in 1866 and lived here until her death in 1884. Now, the second woman that I would like to talk about today is Daisy Lampkin, and this is a picture of her. I love the pictures we have of Daisy. She always looks very elegant, no matter what the occasion. Now, Daisy is considered by some to be one of the great American women of the 20th century, but she has been all but forgotten in Pittsburgh, where she lived from 1909 until her death in 1965. The women's suffrage movement, the NAACP, the Urban League, the Red Cross, the Pittsburgh Courier, and state and city politics all benefited from Daisy Lampkin's energy and dedication. And this is a, an image of Daisy as a young woman. Daisy spent most of her childhood in Reading, Pennsylvania and moved to Pittsburgh in 1909 when she married William Lampkin. Her first organizational effort involved consumer protests by housewives but she was determined to attain equal suffrage for the two oppressed segments of American society, women and African-Americans. She became affiliated with the National Suffrage League and promoted successful women's suffrage events, including city quarter campaigns in 1912. 
before suffrage was a popular cause. In 1915, she became the third president of the Negro Women's Equal Franchise Federation, which later became the Lucy Stone Civic League, a group she led for 40 years. Under her direction, Allegheny County's African-American community raised more than $2 million for Liberty Bonds during World War I. After the war, she won a subscription contest sponsored by the Pittsburgh Courier. When the paper couldn't pay its promised cash award, she was given stock in the paper. Over the years, she increased her holdings until she was named vice president of the corporation in 1929, a position she held for the rest of her life. And the Courier by the 1950s was the most widely circulated black newspaper in the world. This is what the Courier mask had looked like in the 1940s underneath the title of it, the Pittsburgh Courier, it reads, America's Best Weekly. This is a, it, an image of the Pittsburgh Courier's Chicago office. So it did indeed travel all over the United States. Copies of it were taken by the Pullman Porters into the South. And this is an image from the Second World War. This shows the Courier Double V campaign. There are three individuals standing in the picture, two men and a woman. The woman in the center is Daisy Lampkin. She is holding a sign that says, V for victory at home, V for Victory Abroad, the St. Louis branch of the NAACP. The man to the left is holding a sign that says stop lynchings and a man to the right is holding a sign that says Americans all. The double V campaign that the Pittsburgh Courier promoted was, as Daisy Sign says, V for victory abroad. And the V for victory at home was a reduction, the elimination of prejudice and racism in the United States. Early in her career, Daisy made the candid statement about the necessity for women in leadership roles. Our male leadership is so busy with their private interests that nothing is done unless women do it. It was her influence that led to the election of African-Americans Robert Logan to the Pittsburgh City Council in 1919 and Homer S. Brown to the state legislature in 1934. It was Daisy Lampkin who persuaded Thurgood Marshall to become a member of the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. He remembered when she phoned him and said, darling, it's about time you left Baltimore and moved to New York to work where you are most needed. And in 1954, it was Thurgood Marshall who argued the case of Brown versus the Board of Education before the US Supreme Court. And this is an image of Daisy Lampkin with Thurgood Marshall. And as always, Daisy is beautifully attired. I love her pictures. Only six years after Americans gained the right to vote, she was elected as an alternate delegate at large to the National Republican Party Convention, an outstanding achievement for any African American or woman of that time. From 1935 till 1947, she was the National Field Secretary of the NAACP. 
you can see in this picture that Daisy is standing here holding a poster for an NAACP youth demonstration on February the 12th to stop the lynching of African Americans, particularly in the South. In 1945, she was named the NAACP Woman of the Year, since in the previous year, she raised over $1 million and directed the enrollment of the largest membership in the history of the group. When Kay Leroy Irvis graduated from college and could not find a job, Daisy arranged for him to live in Thurgood Marshall's mother's house in Baltimore and take a job as a school teacher. Later, she persuaded him to move to Pittsburgh to work for the Urban League. He lived in a third floor apartment in her building in the Hill District and worked for her on the Courier when he couldn't get a job after law school. Irvis later became the longest serving speaker of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. In addition to her work for civil and women's rights, it was Daisy Lampkin who was instrumental in persuading doctors to donate their time to church clinics to fight outbreaks of tuberculosis during the great migration in the 1930s of African Americans from the South. Daisy and her husband, William, never had children, but she spent much of her time raising money for orphans and widows, for scholarships for youth in the community and for church mortgages. Again, an image of Daisy speaking before a group and during the 40s, 50s, even the beginning of the 60s, when a woman was out in public, generally speaking, she wore a hat. And this is quite a creation that Daisy is wearing. Daisy Lampkin suffered a severe stroke in 1964 while conducting an NAACP membership drive in Camden, New Jersey. Two months later, she was awarded the Eleanor Roosevelt Mary McLeod Bethune World Citizenship Award, which was accepted on her behalf by her good friend, Lena Horn. She died in 1965. In 1983, a state historic marker was placed outside her home on Webster Avenue in the Hill District, and the sign reads, Outstanding as an NAACP organizer, Mrs. Lampkin was field secretary from 1935 to 1947, President Lucy Stone Civic League 1915 to 1965, a charter member, National Council of Negro Women, and vice president, the Pittsburgh Courier. She lived here until her death in 1965. I hope you have enjoyed learning about these remarkable women. I hope it will inspire you to also read more about them and perhaps read more about other outstanding women who have played such a large role in the history of Western Pennsylvania. Now, if anybody has any questions, I will be happy to try and answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. That was wonderful. So while we wait for some questions to come in for the audience, the first one that I have for you is how out of all of the women in Western Pennsylvania history, did you pick uh, Jane Grace Wishelm and Daisy Lampkin to pair together for this session? It's interesting. I've done talks about famous women of Western Pennsylvania, um, and I had put a, together a program about suffrage in Western Pennsylvania in the 19th Amendment. And when we decided to do this program, I thought these women both worked for the same causes, they were, one was white, one was black. They lived in different centuries, but they were so 
committed to the same things. Um, when you think about Jane Gray Swiss Home and abolition, and the fact she also worked for women's rights, I've often thought she probably was not an easy woman to live with, but she had a mission in life. And she was also a writer. And then we have Daisy Lampkin, who lived almost 100 years later. And again, she was involved in the suffrage movement. She was involved in the NAACP. Although I think Daisy was had probably been a woman that was much easier to live with because she dealt with people in a different way. And truthfully, they each of the women lived in different times. Um, so they were a little bit freer and a little bit more. If you lived in the 20th century, you had few more rights, even for an African-American woman, than you would have had living in the 19th century. So I just thinking about them, I thought about their similarities and how it would be interesting to talk about them and how brave each of them was in her own way to do this. This is not an easy thing to do, to get up and speak in front of people and to write and to call people out who aren't doing what you think they should be doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've been getting some comments here in terms of thank you and glad to know more about these important women, because as you pointed out, uh, these are women who are now largely forgotten. Even Daisy, who lived in this community until the 60s, still largely um, forgotten by large swaths of the Right. People don't know about these women. It's, and, it just, it, to me, it's fascinating. I loved learning about them. So that was actually the question I was going to ask. We called the series Uncovering Pittsburgh Stories. And I know you had done some research prior that you've talked about both of these women before. But was there anything as you prepared for this session that stood out to you that you uncovered that was surprising or unexpected? I think when I started looking for images, it was interesting. Um, I loved finding the image of Daisy holding the sign for the WV campaign during the Second World War. Um, I, I read a little bit more about Jane Gray Swiss Helm, and I didn't include it in the talk, but there were comments made because a woman's worth in the 19th century had a lot to deal with how she looked and somebody referred to her as a hatchet face. So yes, um, I always did find her marriage quite interesting. I've, I've never figured out why she married him because he was obviously a mother's boy. And the more I read about it, the more I thought, mm, this was not a good marriage. But it was interesting that she managed to keep on with her life after she was divorced because divorce in the 19th century was just not something you did. It was anathema. And, um, you know, he, he got his divorce by saying she abandoned him. And he tried that tactic earlier. You would have thought she'd have had enough sense to leave him earlier, but that's not what women could do back then. So these things, it's, I just, I found them fascinating. I think it's interesting to find these things out about the women as you read more. So there, there's, it, it's just kind of fun to dig into it and, and see the images. And when you look at um, how they were dressed even, when you look at Jane Grace, well, someone she had to wear corsets and those big skirts and just getting around would have been an ordeal or getting dressed. I've often thought about having to be dressed like that in the middle of a hot summer. Uh, and then I contrasted it when you look at Daisy who always looks so elegant in her pictures. I just think it's wonderful and, and how times have changed even in that amount of time. So we are basically the beneficiaries of what these women were working towards. Yeah, that's a wonderful reminder, Judy. And also the idea, I think, that the people stories, the stories of them as individuals and thinking about what they had to encounter in their daily lives um, for the causes that they served is something that's really important. I, um, I, yeah, yeah, reading about the, I love the people. I love the stories about the people because it just, and you have to put yourself in the context of when they were living as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are actually right at our time. So perfect timing. 
Um, I'm going to thank everyone for joining us. Um, a huge thank you to Judy for not only doing such a wonderful job, but for being the first person willing in our series here and uncovering Pittsburgh stories. This is a series that we're going to have throughout the summer with the docents from the History Center that we are excited about seeing how this all uh, unfurls a range of Pittsburgh stories that we're going to have to share. And this is also just sort of one story that we are connecting to a much larger initiative we have called Women Forging the Way, which celebrates the centennial of the 19th Amendment this year and uh, the right to vote for women that was hard fought uh, and, and well earned and thinking about that. So there will be a continuation of these stories um, throughout the year. So thank you for joining. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and um, make sure that we all sort of stay fearless in our care and activism for each other and our communities. So thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>